I do uh, like to see it incorporated in, in just about everybody's daily routine. So I will get rolling. Uh, it's uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Definitely a little bit of time for anybody else to, wants to tune in. Uh, quick, that's me riding a bike. Um, and those are my coordinates if you ever did want to, uh, to chat, uh, Andrew at awicoaching.com. Or you can reach me at the, my website, uh, awicoaching.com. And so getting right into the strength and conditioning training benefits for aerobic athletes and for cyclists and <clears throat> these are the main benefits that I look to when working with athletes and cyclists if I was to boil it all down into uh, into three things um, one would be injury prevention and I would I would put don't bone density into that um, versus overuse and, and acute um, making sure that our bones are healthy bone good bone density through resistance training and impact um, having some impact in our in our daily routine cycling isn't necessarily a weight bearing activity so adding uh, weight bearing activities does help with that making sure our tendons are well conditioned are our ligaments, muscles, all those things help with overuse injuries and also acute injuries. And what I mean by acute is crashing. And as cyclists, whether we are on the road, mountain bike, cyclocross, track, any, any cycling discipline, um, there's, there's an element of, of risk and crashing and going over the bars and you stick your arm out. And for some people, you know, they break their collarbone, and they separate their shoulders. And not that strength training can pre prevent 100% of those, but it can certainly help having good, um, having good, uh, good strength training foundation in the upper body and the shoulders can certainly help, you know, with that one example. Resiliency. Uh, and I mean resiliency throughout an entire season and season over season as well a, a good well-rounded athlete which is kind of been my next point they'll be able to uh handle a little bit more stress and that more that isn't quite training stress it's not quite tss um but they'll be able to handle um especially for mountain bike athletes cyclocross athletes who are on the bike a lot off the bike a lot crashing bumping into each other um you know, having a good strength and conditioning program to help that in the off season um, pays dividends throughout the season and, and year over year. And also, and this might be more in the conditioning bucket of strength and conditioning, but enhance physical literacy and just helping to build a more rounded athlete. Um, that's another reason why I like to incorporate some of these, uh, these things in there. Um, trust me when I say you can you can actually be not a great athlete but a, a really good cyclist um, but that's not necessarily the goal we do want to be pretty uh, good athletes as well and, and cyclocross I always come back to it because it has a very large athletic component to it um, getting on and off your bike quickly and smoothly is, is a, its own athletic achievement um, dismounting running over barriers jumping back on Dismounting on a climb, dismounting on a downhill. Um, it, it's a very athletic discipline. So, you know, sometimes I've seen some very, very good athletes um, who might not be the best cyclists or the best cyclists of the time really do well at cross because they have that, they are a well rounded athlete. And a lot of that comes into agility training and, and some other things like that. So, we'll, we'll get into some more examples of that. So yeah, a couple of questions. Um, yeah, I remember seeing Pete D, Pete to Sarah, I assume, crash at Hardwood, solid crash off a drop. Oh yeah, that was in 2019 Nationals. He was not even phased, just got back up and kept going. Exactly. I think they we caught that one on, or someone caught that on video. I was I was racing at the time. Um, but yeah, a good example of, of, you know, if Pete wasn't as strong as he was, that, that might have resulted in injury. It's sometimes luck um uh pays off in those situations and as andrew said yeah adrenaline um sometimes you're hurt and don't even really know it um but uh, it is one that's a big one 
uh, a big one that I, I you know, that I look to for strength and conditioning. You'll notice that I don't necessarily have on here that um, being stronger uh, doesn't necessarily contribute to more power on the bike or especially in the more longer term being strong like being as strong as you can possibly be as a person doesn't necessarily help your 20 minute power um and I'll, I'll i'll get more into that in a little bit but that's not what i go for with strength i go for these things with strength and i i le sometimes leave a little bit on the table with strength but i'm okay with that because i'm training athletes using strength and conditioning um, in a well-rounded program to make them faster on the bike. Um, and that, that's my priority as a cycling coach. Um, I've, my strength and conditioning background is I do seminars and I've done sport conferences with, with strength and conditioning coaches. Uh, I've worked with strength and conditioning coaches with high performance athletes in developing a all around program. So that's where I'm coming from with, with, uh, with an SNC background. And um, I've seen some great examples. I've seen some examples of maybe pushing a little bit too far. I have my own war story with that, which I think I'm going to save to the end so that uh, it's, it's an optional uh, credit scene of, of my, own, uh, my own war story, which has probably influenced me a little bit um, throughout the years. Uh, so moving on. And again, if you're just tuning in, I can see a few more uh, eyeballs there. Ask any questions as we're going along. We're chatting about strength and conditioning and incorporating that into our cycling program. So again, uh, tonight's webinar, it, it's really going into, I'm really just trying to boil things down um, for as many people as possible. Knowing that I could have 15 year old listening to this, I could have a 60 year old listening to this. Um, I'm really just giving the Coles notes on how I look at it and how I incorporate it with with cyclists from a from a broad perspective and for cyclists and I've underlined and bolded that and uh, I should almost say performance cyclists or cyclists who are, are who are trying to push their cycling performance up this is how I incorporate it into their training program um, I'll get to Lynn's question. So we don't all have to balance a ball, flip plates, and do math equations to be fast. Um, no, Len, but I actually kind of like some of that stuff. Um, but no, you don't have to do that to be, to be fast. At the end of the day, and this is where, you know, I, I, you know, might get angry feedback from strength and conditioning coaches. At the end of the day, it's our aerobic system that drives us as cyclists. And our aerobic system is going to determine our performance on a bike and our strength, strength and conditioning, just like nutrition, just like recovery and sleep, um, just like mental uh, strength on the bike, um, resilient, mental resiliency, all those things support that aerobic system and they're just like fingers in those cogs that that help um, keep that aerobic system so that you know functioning or so that our aerobic system can perform because our body's there to perform along with it but our aerobic system is is what drives our performance so first kind of bullet point um, if you are training as a cyclist and especially if you're not in the off season like you are into your base season build getting close to your race season your aerobic training, and that doesn't necessarily have to be cycling, that can be cross-country skiing or snowshoeing or rowing, um, swimming, if you have access to an indoor pool right now, um, should remain the dominant source of any fatigue and your training stress. Meaning if the strength training starts to become dominant, becomes to the driving force of where your fatigue is coming from or muscle soreness, and it's affecting your on the bike training, then it's time to back off the strength and conditioning training. And I, I hope that kind of makes sense. Your aerobic training needs to come first as a cyclist. Uh, when I've seen strength go too far, 
usually that's the one bullet point that that if we we really look to is where where's the stress coming from where's the soreness coming from uh where's training going off the rails and if it's on the strength end then the prior your priorities as a cyclist is the aerobic stuff so keep that in mind check in with that every once in a while i use a general rule of thumb again it can be a little bit above a little bit below this but about 15 to 20 percent of your overall training volume is strength and conditioning and that's typically how i look at um you know a low volume athlete high volume athlete professional volume athlete uh so about if if somebody's doing about six hours a week i might aim for about an hour and a half or 90 minutes of strength and conditioning 15 hours a week you can start to get up towards four hours um it doesn't always scale up 100 percent, but at 20 hours a week yeah you might be able to you know, some athletes might be doing more than that. Um, but if I was to use the other example or an extreme example, if you're training six hours a week, or if that's all you have, you only have six hours a week to train and three to four of that is in the gym, then you might not be developing into the best cyclist you can be. Um, and maybe that's okay. Um, but just keep that in mind. Are, are you, uh, you know, aiming for, um, to be a strongest person you can be or the best cyclist you can be. And they're not always the same thing. Keep the strength training focused on building strength. And so to, one of the best ways to do that is, is two to three sets, five to six reps, but those reps aren't to failure. So on the sixth rep, you're not dropping the weight because you can't lift it again. You could lift that again 10, 11, 12 more or to those, you know, 10, 11, 12 times, but you just lift it five or six times and then you drop the weight. That will help build strength without um, a lot of hypertrophy effect or muscle building effect because that's what you're aiming to do as a cyclist. You're trying to build strength. You're not necessarily trying to put on muscle mass. Um, the older you are, the harder it is to put on muscle mass. But just again, as a general rule of strength, uh, general rule of thumb, you're trying to get stronger, not just bigger. You're not just trying to get bigger muscles. That's not the point of strength training as an aerobic athlete. And that's kind of where my war story is based. But again, I won't I won't bore you with that right now. That's that's a post credits war story. Um, a great example of that is actually, I did a seminar with the national strength coach for the women's track endurance program. And he was kind of chatting and one of the, one of the methods they use to actually inhibit hypertrophy or muscle building is they try to pair up as much as possible, a two hour endurance ride after their strength workouts so that they don't put on muscle mass. They, they want the athletes to be, you know, about where they are, um, uh, muscle mass, uh, lean muscle mass wise. So they go out, do endurance to inhibit that effect. Um, another good rule of thumb is s strength training shouldn't make you sore. And if you're, if it's constantly making you sore, if you haven't picked up a weight, if you haven't done strength exercise, uh, you might be sore on that first or second time. But uh, generally speaking, chronically speaking, it shouldn't make you sore and you should feel ready to work out after a strength workout. If you're absolutely annihilated after a strength workout, you might have went a little bit too hard, keeping in mind that we're ta talking about strength training as, a, as an aerobic athlete, as a cyclist. So let me know if anybody has any questions with those, um, with those bullet points. I'll be happy to come back um if anybody types in a question but that's not the end got more slides ahead um so again a um, couple more things and and again more on the maybe the c side of the snc is that uh i always like to have some core stability in every strength routine um and even at just a minimum if that's all a person's doing then i'm usually pretty happy and adding a few weights to some of those core routines really does, does help. I have a couple examples coming up. Adding in some um, agility work and 
using agility ladders, cones, um, those, I don't even know what you call them, the little bars that you jump over. Um, all those things can actually really help you with the cyclist. If you're a cross rider and you're uh, incorporating some agility work will help you quite a bit. Um, and also some jumps, jumping and throws. And I don't mean bike jumps, I mean uh, box jumps, plyometrics, and throws are where, uh, if you have never done it before, it's actually kind of fun. You, you pick up a weighted medicine ball. It doesn't have to be heavy. It's not about how heavy it is. It's not about even how far you throw it. Um, but you just throw it forward, chest passes, overhead throws. Uh, there's a few different variations there. Those are really fun to do and also a great way to add um, a little bit more dynamic movement into your uh, strength and conditioning programs. Hurdles. Thank you, Andrew. I knew there's probably a name for it. Those, yeah, like the mini hurdles, but uh, yes. Um, so again, just broadly speaking, we're using strength training to help prevent, if we go back to one of my, the, one of the first slides, we're using it to help prevent injury on the bike or help minimize injury in the bike. Uh, I don't know if I'm using the right words there, but minimize the impact of crashing let's say but don't risk getting hurt in the gym to do that so keep that in mind um there's when you start getting into you know you can go pretty deep into strength training and olympic lifting is is kind of what comes to mind um if you're kind of scared of doing a, a strength exercise, whether that's an Olympic lift or just a really heavy back squat, even if you have a spot or even if you're in a good squat rack, um, that maybe you're, you're pushing a little bit too hard because remember the goal, you're trying to not injure yourself. Um, but if you injure yourself at the gym, what's the point as a cyclist underlined bold bolded. Um, if you want to see how much you can back squat in your lifetime, then go for it. But uh, as a cyclist, it's okay to leave that last 5% on the rack, um, is what I said, or, or on the table. And another quick example of that is um, going back a couple years now, the young athlete training, and, and I think they were, um, this, this might not have been a coach-directed activity, but trying to outdo each other on a box jump and trying to jump higher and higher. And the athlete, you know, the box jump got pretty high, and if you've ever done a box jump, the arms, that, that's a big component to it, really throwing the arms up uh, to initiate that movement. And the athlete came up, hit the box with their hand and broke their hand while trying to go that extra few inches on this box jump and, and missed a few races and had to race in a cast and those kinds of things. So again, that's just one kind of cautionary tale um, of maybe maybe don't go for that last 5% when we're talking about strength and conditioning. Keep it fun. Don't get, don't do it to the point of getting sore. Um, you know, maybe you're not trying to get a personal best on those exercises that, that could injure you. So I hope that makes sense. And that's, you know, if I was to sum up my philosophy on strength training for cyclists, it would kind of be in these last two slides here. Um, as again, Cole's notes, um, you know, do it. It's always good to lift a weight versus not lift a weight or do resistance training versus not do resistance training, but keep it in check. If you're, if you're a cyclist, it should complement your training on the bike, not overtake it. Uh, most of the time there could be times in the off season, uh, you know, you're in October, you're not training for a race until the next year around July. Maybe you are doing a little bit more in October, November, but for the most part, and I'll give you a little bit more guidance on that coming up. Okay, so some equipment, some go-to equipment. Um, again, not, none of this mandatory, but I just kind of thought of like, you know, what what I want, what do I want? You know, I have most of the stuff. If you don't have access to a gym, even if you do have access to a gym, some of the stuff's a little bit tricky, but a stability ball or a, a workout ball is the, I, you know, you gotta have one of those. Um, workout mat, yoga mat. Um, if you have hardwood floors, really, you know, get a good thick workout mat, even even a double thickness of your yoga mat. That can really help 
um, increase comfort, especially on your knees, if you're kneeling, that kind of thing, and doing strength. Uh, okay, I'm seeing a question come in. Uh, what about other sports like hockey for agility? Uh, yes, actually, Nicole, that's a great one. Um, and I, I would put that into like that cross training bucket, um, and that coordinating or, or sorry, conditioning bucket as well. Cross country skiing is another great one for, for agility training, soccer, basketball, any of those other sports will help with agility as well. Um, I, I guess if you don't have those, uh, it's not a bad idea to get an agility ladder, which is third from the bottom there. And I have a quick, I have a photo of one coming up. They're, they're pretty cheap. You can get them 20, 25 bucks on, on Amazon, I'm sure. Um, and do some of those exercises. It, you know, if you aren't a regular hockey player, like I'm not, um, or basketball or doing all those things, uh, it can really go a long way. So another quick one from Adam, should we keep SNC going through it the entire season? Yes, to some degree. And depending if I was to go back to that volume consideration, and also the time of year and, and what you're doing, but I would always try to incorporate some core work um, at, at a minimum throughout an entire season. And depending on what what's you know happening in the athlete season, do a little some jumps and throws and those kinds of things. But there should always be a some there should always be some component of strength and conditioning uh, throughout a season. So back to the list, uh, a few dumbbells. Those don't even have to be pairs of dumbbells. If they're pairs, great. If you just have one dumbbell, um, that's fine too, because you can do a lot of this, uh, stuff single-sided. Um, a 40 or 60 pound kettlebell would be great, or a weight plate. Even if you have like a, a, a maybe it'd be like a 45 pound weight plate, just something that's, you know, one thing that's a little bit heavier would help and go a long way. A medicine ball or two so those are the ones that uh, they're they're rubber they're about the size of maybe a little bit smaller than a basketball and those are the things that you can throw um, those are pretty handy slam balls uh, they're a little bit different than a medicine ball but also really handy for for throws battle rope it would be another like add-on I've got one that it, it's uh, it can be a lot a little bit of fun um, plyo box or just really something to jump onto and again, it's, you know, I had one athlete tell me it's not about how high you're, you know, plyo boxes aren't about jumping higher. They're about jumping and you're just landing on the box. Um, it's not about going higher and higher and higher. You're just trying to, you know, land a little bit, uh, not back where you started. And some cones, just some of those small little soccer cones. Those can go a long way in setting up some drills. All right, so a couple examples, and I just I, I, I didn't screenshot these purely out of um, laziness. I, I screenshot them just so you know, um, you know, these are just some of the examples that I use with the athletes that I coach, and a couple of you guys are on here. You've probably seen these. Um, so a couple of the core routines, um, and those are some of the examples of, again, just really simple things that you've probably done before. Um, you might need to Google some of those. I've, I, you know, I didn't want to put up my whole PDFs here, but um, they usually have descriptions or links to videos. Um, side planks, front planks. The one thing with those is I wouldn't go any more than 30 seconds with them. I would keep them around 20, 30 seconds and then do a quick drop, do them again. So get another quick question here. So quick, yeah, box jumps, if you don't have one, the best go-to that I would use for that would be either a um, like a picnic table uh, or a park bench, something stable that you can jump on that's not going to move. Um, that those are as far as outside goes. Inside might be a little bit tricky. You do want to be safe, um, but generally speaking, if if you're jumping higher, whether it's you know hopefully two three feet and landing a little bit higher and it's stable, it's not gonna move, you can use that as a box jump. Yep, yeah, where you live might have an impact. Absolutely, Andrew. So a lot of that, a lot of these, and I have some examples of this where I worked with a youth program a couple years ago um, and or I ran our youth program and we would do uh, some of this cross training or strength and conditioning every fall. We'd take two months, wouldn't even bring the bikes, it was once a week 
and we did all of this stuff outside. So with the throws, you can, you know, we just found a park and the park had picnic tables. So the picnic tables are what, where we did our jumps onto. We had lots of room to, to do throws safely without hitting anybody. Um, and I just bring a, a, a few weights, battle rope, and just make a circuit. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Like if you live in an apartment, you know, you might not be doing wall throws with a medicine ball. Um, so that's one of the trickier things with strength and strength is what do you have access to? And I know Hank was on last night saying, Hey, all the gyms are closed now. So what do you do? And I always like to, to try to start with, with whole exercises or routines that you really can do anywhere. Um, and these, these are examples where hopefully you can do in your home, or at least if you have some green space nearby or a park or, you know, something nearby that, that you can, uh, utilize. So again, a couple of the examples of, of some core routines and, um, the athletes would usually do a few circuits of those, or they might do both, um, depending on the athlete that, that I'm working with and where they're at. Um, one, a quick, simple strength routine would be on the left would be, you know, two sets of five reps. Um, and that's not every exercise, but that I would basically say pick one. So either leg press, a goblet squat, split, split squat, lunge, you know, pick one of those and that's your go-to exercise. And then I have a few examples of some upper body ones. And those are really my go-to, my four go-to upper body would be a bench press with dumbbells, a one arm row, kneeling uh, shoulder press, and a tricep extension. If you, if, uh, if you do all those, you uh, work on your shoulders in, in a few different ways that, that I find uh, can really help with uh, you know fatigue as well, um, but also injury, injury, injury prevention. And uh, all of those really minus the, the leg press you can do with minimal amount of equipment. Um, and if I was to pick one out of those uh, leg exercises would be the goblet squat. That would be uh, the one because you can pretty much do it with anything. Pick up, you know, a liquid laundry detergent jug. And usually they have like pretty good handles on them now. And as long as it's got some weight to it, you know, they're probably around 10 pounds or so. Um, just something. Um, if you do have one of those weight plates and have a good grip on it, you can use that for a goblet squat. Um, so again, you, you know, sometimes it's up to the athlete to be a little bit creative with what they have access to. Um, and I always like to think of, don't worry too much about the, the actual exact weight of what you're lifting, just lift something. And I was thinking about this the other day of when I win the lottery, cause I'm a positive thinker, not if, when, um, and when I open Andrew Watson's cycling training center. I'm not going to have weights on any, I'm not going to have the weights number, like the weight number on anything. It's just going to be color coded. So there's going to be a bunch of color kettlebells and they'll be bigger. So you don't know how they'll get heavier, but it'll just be like, yeah, the blue ones were pretty heavy last week. I'm going to pick up the green ones because they're a little bit lighter this week. That would be my, my gym. That would be my cycling training gym. Um, I don't want to use cycling gym cause that could be trademarked still, but that would be my cycling training gym is just pick up some weights, move some things around. Um, if I was to use, and I'll actually use the jump and throw, uh, example too. You can, I'm sure you've probably read through some of those. Um, a buddy of mine who I used to race with Jesse, he was basically living in a van traveling around racing before it was cool, like 20 years ago. And he wanted to keep his strength training going. So what he would do, he was in the, the southern U.S. in the desert, he would just go find a rock. He would go find a good-sized rock. He'd pick up a few rocks, figure out which one was the right weight, and that's what he would use to do a strength workout with because he was just in a, he was in a minivan, didn't have room for weights and things, and he would just go find the right rock, and he would either throw it or lift it or squat with it. Um, so there's ways to be um, creative with these things. Might be a couple other ones. Laundry detergent, great idea, so much cheaper than weights. Yeah, it's, um, the, weights are really expensive. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to pay, you know, sometimes you're paying two or $3 a pound for a weight. So a 50 pound kettlebell can be uh, pretty expensive. So 
be creative, check Kijiji. You know, it's not uncommon for people to kind of get rid of that stuff. Um, but again, it's more important to lift something. Don't worry about if it's the exact same weight as it was last week. Um, you know, I guess what I'm saying is it's okay to kind of ballpark these things as long as you go back to those principles. Um, don't overdo it. Don't, it shouldn't make you sore. Um, it's, it, you're just doing it. Um, and you know, it's going to make you better. You know, it's going to make you more injury resistant, more rounded athlete and, um, be able to, re- you know, sustain your body throughout a, a season and season over season. And yes, my training center would have pizza nearby that, that would be uh, n- not optional. So, okay. So I'm going to keep going a couple more slides. Feel free to ask any questions as we go along. So I wanted to kind of just quickly, this is just a quick example of a low volume week and how I might lay it out for an athlete. Um, so the 17th, that would be a Monday. So just this is just, again, just a really quick example of give them some core with some simple weights. So, um, you know, two of those, an hour of that for the week on the Monday, Thursday, some specific work maybe on the Tuesday, an endurance something on the Wednesday, and that could be a ride as well. But let's say this athlete lives in Horseshoe Valley and they can head out and cross country ski in the middle of winter. Well, go ahead and cross country ski or snowshoe. Another specific workout, and then maybe some two longer endurance days on the weekend. That might be one example of a lower volume athlete. So another uh, higher volume athlete. And again, this is, I think this was about 16, 17 hours. Um, I might, include a active recovery spin with some strength maintenance and some jumps and some throws uh bike specific generally speaking you know i would have three days a week of strength in there or some strength and conditioning along with several um or a couple of specific bike workouts and some long endurance on the weekend so quick example of how i might structure it for the average you know could be nine to five, um, maybe nine to five student, or, or university student that might have a little bit more time on the Wednesday. But again, that might change depending on who it is. Um, full season, again, in a nutshell, if I was to like really break down what I, what I focus on or, or what, when I would have athletes focus on things, maybe, um, and Olympic lifting is one of those big maybes, but basically like off season, base season, for a lot of people, that's now. That's where we're at. This is the time where you want to be building strength, adding some volume to your strength. Um, if you were in a situation to do Olympic lifting, this would be kind of the time towards the end of your base season. Uh, and core. The core is always going to be in there. Um, Olympic lifting, just in case quickly if nobody's ever done olympic lifting or seen olympic lifting that's like uh, i don't even know all the names of them i've done it uh you know s- clean and uh yeah power clean clean snatch i can't even remember what they're all called um somebody might be a list in there that's one of those ones where it's like that extra five percent and i did olympic lifting for a winter and it was awesome but i did that with a strength and conditioning coach it wasn't my cycling coach my cycling coach said, I don't know enough about this. Go go see this person here and they'll guide you through that. And it was one on one. But again, if I was to if I was to even think about doing that now, it, it would frighten me. Um, but again, that's you know, again, that was me doing 20, 25 hours a week of training. Um, but but now would be kind of the time to be looking at that. So a quick one. Incorporate strength work through it the day as time allows an effective alternative to a dedicated session yeah i it's better than i would say it would be better than not doing a dedicated or you know not doing a dedicated session um if you can incorporate some of it throughout the day then yeah absolutely it's always nice if you can put it into a session but if you can incorporate it in i think just try to be a little bit focused with it and focus with the reps um focus with the movements but uh, absolutely, that, that's a great alternative. Advisable to do strength and conditioning if you are sore. I, I would say d- it depends. I know that's such a classic coach, coach answer. Um, you don't want to be that sore, but if it's a normal training sore, like just 
fatigue, you might still be doing a little bit of it. You might just need to warm up a little bit more. But if you're acutely sore, let's say, you know, Adam, you just did a cross country ski and it was your first cross country skate ski of the year. And you're a little bit sore in the upper body because you haven't, you know, pushed um, that hard with your upper body. Maybe you do skip the upper body component. Um, yeah, I, I would say you wouldn't really want to do it if you're sore. You want to space them out so that you're not sore doing them. Um, but use your best judgment. You know, it's okay. You're always going to feel, if you're training, you should always feel a little bit tired. A l- like a tiny, not sore, but like tiny bit fatigue. Like a little bit here and there, a little tight here and there. Um, but if it's like acute soreness where, wow, I need an Advil to get through this strength workout, then no, I, w- I wouldn't do another strength workout. Um, so back to the yeah, quickly, the slide, um, and then a build and race phase. So for us here in Ontario, you know, you're probably starting to look at, uh, late March, April, May, I'd move more to a strength maintenance program where you're not necessarily trying to build your strength or lift more lift more weight or, or lift more reps um, or sets, I should say. Uh, you're just trying to kind of maintain what you're doing. I, I It's a great time to incorporate some jumps and throws. If that's something you didn't have time for before and you want to change it up a little bit, jumps and throws, because they actually can work really well with intensity training. If you don't do too many of them, it's actually a great way to just activate yourself. Uh, and core. Core is always there. So yeah, quickly, um, this was uh, on the left. This was a couple of young guys that I was coaching uh, in a youth program, a couple of riders from the hardwood uh, um, program. And uh, you can see their bikes on trainers there. This was at at a gym that that we were working out of. So before they did their specific bike workout for the night or the, you know, we'd meet once a, a week in the evening and then once on Saturday. I'd have them do 15, 20 minutes of core. Um, they'd grab it, they'd set up their bikes, grab a mat, and we'd we'd run through a core routine. Um, so it was a great way to just incorporate a little bit of that because I knew they probably weren't doing it at home on their own. Um, and on the right there was some again that off season. This was you know October, November. We would just meet once a week in our program, and I would just have a bunch of cones, battle ropes that agility ladder which you can see in in, uh, in front of the, one of the athletes there and we would just you know it was it was a lot of fun you know i'd add i'd add structure there was always a plan for each night um but it was a great way to just you know become or spend a little bit of time becoming just better athletes and not just bike riders um and that was a way to uh yeah prioritize the season periodize the season i know that's kind of a big fancy word but really it just means you know changing things a little bit throughout the season it's not you know we wouldn't do this every every um you know throughout an entire season uh, mainly because of time if i you know can only work with athletes once or twice a week i'm gonna you know focus on what i need to if it's may i'm not gonna be focusing on agility training and focusing on riding or intervals or speed work i should say um, but in the fall, it's fun to do these things or in the winter, pardon me. Um, so, oh, that, that was my last slide. Actually, I thought I had one more. Okay. Apologies. So last, so that was the last slide. Um, I'll tell my war story in a second after I answer these questions. So if you have any questions, great time to type those, type those up. Sore lower back or shoulders on long rides. How to determine if more core work is needed or more time on the bike to get body used to long rides. Couple of things that could be going on there. When I hear shoulders, not so much lower back, but shoulders, I think of bike fit. Um, and that's one of the things I would look to for, for shoulder pain is, is what's the fit look like? What's the bar height look like, reach? Um, hood angle, those things for, for shoulders. Lower backs are tricky and it's kind of like cramps. It's kind of like leg cramps is if you ask somebody why, why their low back is sore. Um, or if you ask 10 people, you might get 10 different answers, right? Just with, why do we cramp dehydration, not enough salt, not, you know, eat mustard, all those things. So it's one of those things that everybody has, everybody's sore back might be 
um, sore for a different reason. So I want, I do want to be cautious with that um, and say that you should always start with, uh, you know, chatting either with a chiropractor or a physiotherapist to see if there's anything chronic going on, if there's a, a, a maybe a pre-existing injury, um, you know, an imbalance, something going on there. But in general, I would say, I would say it's more, I don't know if more core work would always be the answer or, or long rods would be the answer, but maybe just a combination of both. But I would definitely make sure the position is dialed and maybe even having a, two people look at your position because even bike fitters go to 10 different bike fitters. You'll get 10 different bike fits. Um, so there could be a few things going on there and, and I'm, I apologize for the vague answer. Um, but it, it, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Other than that, I, I would say if it's always sore, then, then something needs to change for sure. Um, and it might not always be core work. So what core work gets do you like beyond planks? Good question. Um, so let me go back to that one. Um, the planks are good. Oh, looks like it might've cut out. Okay, so I think it cut out there. All right, so I, I cut out. I hope I'm back on. <clears throat> um, so these are these are some of my go-to core exercises. Um, and you might have to Google those to see what they look like. Um, and some of them do use a little bit of weight, but those would be my go-tos there. So hopefully you can see those, but uh, planks, uh, bridges on on a stability ball when it says on ball that's what it means is the workout ball the stability ball four points so anytime that you're challenging your core with with stability I, I like those kinds of of exercises the plank dumbbell drag is where you're in a front plank and you're dragging something from one side to the other you alternate hands I like that one um, anytime that you're just challenging yourself in those plank type positions Russian twist, wood chops, not quite a core workout, but uh, Superman's glute bridge march, those are all great uh, core exercises. And you can Google core exercises, thousands of them come up, but those are the ones that I like, I like to prescribe. I feel like they're low risk, um, as long as you don't push them that much. Um, yeah, so, um, so we're coming to the end. Thank you all for uh, tuning in again tonight. Uh, 7.45, that's pretty good. I always kind of aim for that 30 to 45 minute mark. So quick, this is again my post-credits uh, war story on strength training. And um, so years ago, and, and maybe why I'm, I'm biased, or some people think I'm anti-strength, which isn't the case at all. Um, but I, I, I do worry about being too, too heavy into strength. Um, when I was training full time, I, uh, as, as a group and my coach guided this and we, we went really heavy into strength training and for a winter. And again, this, this was the winter, maybe the winter after the Olympic lifting winter. Um, and we were like three, four days a week at a strength and conditioning gym in Barrie. I don't know if it's still there. It was mind to muscle and then changed names a couple times. Great coaches, great strength and conditioning coaches. The Barry Colts train there. We we're always in there at the same time. And, you know, our, our cycling coaches let them have it with us for sure. They, they were like, here are these athletes just, you know, train the hell out of them. So we did. And I put on about 10 pounds of muscle. I actually got leaner. Um, and I, I, I track that with a, with a body composition scale. I, and my power went down. All of my critical powers went down. Um, I, I felt like, I remember chatting with my coach about it. I felt more like a bodybuilder doing, uh, 
cardio on the bike. I couldn't, I couldn't do my bike bike workouts cause I was so sore. Um, but I was ripped like beach body, like, you know, pointing people to the beach all day long, sun's out, guns out. And, but more of the story, I, I, it got to the point where the season was coming up. It was March. Um, I knew I wasn't fast on the bike. I just knew it. And I, I just had to step away from it. And it took a few months. It took a few months of not even looking at a weight to, uh, to, to get back to being a cyclist again. And, you know, am I, am I biased from it? Am I jaded from it? Maybe a little bit, but I, I think I really learned from it. And that's kind of what developed my, those guiding principles uh, for this is I'm not anti-strength. I still do a little bit myself. I prescribe it to all the athletes that I work with in some form or another. Um, but I have seen myself and I have seen other athletes fall down that rabbit hole as well with strength and their performance goes down. Um, strength coaches are great. They're great people. They're very knowledgeable. Um, but sometimes they can, they can push sometimes looking for, for what they want to see in an athlete and a cyclist, um, and kind of forget sometimes that, that the job of cyclists is to ride their bike fast and being really, really strong doesn't always translate to that. So, um, be, uh, be cautious of that. I, I guess is what I'm saying is, um, as a cyclist, if your goal is to ride your bike faster and further and harder, a lot of your work has to be done aerobically and um, with strength supporting that, um, just like nutrition, just like sleep, just like hydration, just like being strong mentally and having a good uh, work ethic, all those things contribute just as much as strength. So that, yeah, that that was kind of my war story, my I, I say war story as as just a as a as a personal tale. Um, so was it cosmetic? It was cosmetic muscle, Andrew, for sure. Like because it wasn't practical for what I was doing. It made me go slower. It was a lot of upper body muscle. In other words, um, it was a lot of arms, shoulders, chest. Um, I could I could Olympic lift. I could bench press. I could do all these things. I could throw a ball really far. But that didn't help me when it came to mountain biking fast. Um, I didn't. I didn't need that much strength. I didn't need that much muscle to do it. Um, so I know that that's what you know. I'm, I might get angry feedback for for people on this or people watching the replay. But it it happened to me. It can happen to other athletes. Um, so you know, just kind of keep that in mind. I yeah. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of cut myself off there. Um, because I could go off in a couple other rants, but uh, that's my how I would look at incorporating strength into a cyclist training programs, without going overboard with that um, in their in their program. So, once again, thanks for tuning in. Um, it is seven fifty or so. Uh, next week, we'll, I will be back. I will be doing nutrition, a nutrition webinar either next week or the week after. I don't want to promise it for next week, but if it's not next week, it'll be the week after, just depending on how this week rolls out. So if you had, uh, if you enjoyed tuning in tonight, um, please, you know, remember, same bat time, same bat channel, 7 p.m. Monday nights. Uh, invite a friend, invite a riding buddy. And uh, if I didn't get to your question or if I didn't answer it quite right tonight, uh, be sure to follow up with me, um, awicoaching.com or uh, Andrew at awicoaching.com. So with that, I will sign off. I hope everyone has a great week. I hope everyone stays healthy. If you have a little cold or the sniffles right now or maybe that other thing, I hope you recover quickly and uh, we all get out on the trails and the roads uh, uh, soon. All right, we'll talk to you later.